late, great Nelson Mandela once said, the best way to change the world is to use education. Growing up, I was taught that education and freedom were married together to be considered the black American dream. That if you were not educated as a black American, you were not truly free. I come from a long line of literacy learners, resiliency, ambition, and tenacity. My great-great-grandparents were sharecroppers down in Leland, Mississippi. Neither were taught to read nor write during that time, but I often remember hearing stories from my elders and ancestors about how my great-great-grandfather was a blacksmith, and he was ambitious enough to teach himself how to write, which at that time could have cost him his life down in Mississippi. Like many black families at that time, my family migrated from Leland, Mississippi to Chicago, Illinois for better opportunities and work. The sacrifices that my great-great-grandparents made were not made in vain, but instead they trickled down the family tree to their only daughter, my HK granny, or Mrs. Hattie Mae Kelly, my great-grandmother. My HK granny was the first example I knew of a lifelong learner before I even knew what the phrase truly was. She started her morning every day with the Chicago Tribune newspaper, a BLT sandwich, and a hot cup of coffee. I remember her telling me as a little girl, Nisha, the newspaper is written at a fifth grade reading level, which means that everybody should be able to read it successfully. Unbeknownst to my granny at that time, she debunked the theory that I had in my young mind that newspapers were only for grown folks and coffee drinkers. After that day, I read more than just the comic section, and my HK granny created a safe space in her home to be able to talk about current events that we read in a newspaper and talk about current events happening in Chicago. As a curious young girl, I often asked questions and shared to her my perspective while she listened intently and allowed me the space while also giving me her wisdom based on her experiences. Outside of just being an avid newspaper reader, she had a ton of other hobbies that included her being a lifelong learner. This all included episodes of Jeopardy, episodes of Will of Fortune, puzzles with hundreds of pieces that she would have on her table, and I would sometimes come over and put them together. And then when she put them all together, she would take them up and frame them in the home. It's like a family project. Also, too, she did word search and crossword puzzles. And even in her late 60s and 70s, HK Granny still had dreams of her own. Outside of just being a phenomenal mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, she had aspirations of being a pianist. I remember her telling me that she always wanted to learn how to play the piano. And so she took a couple of lessons, but for the most part, she was a self-taught pianist in her late 60s. The memories and moments that I share with my great-grandmother, I cherish for the rest of my life. And I only take them with me through life, but through my career. Fast forward a decade later, I started on my own journey as a lifelong learner. It started in undergraduate school when I started my first student, uh, student worker position as a student ambassador. So I was often walking backwards, pointing at random facts on the campus, doing panel discussions with prospective students and parents, helping with program selection, and then also giving dorm tours of my dorm or the sample dorm that we had on campus. At that time, I also did have some experience working in residence life, but it was something about the admissions office that I always came back to. It was the interpersonal communication with another person, helping with program selection, which was one of my favorite things, being informative, lending a helping hand, and giving someone else an opportunity, like somebody gave me an opportunity, and then also just understanding a person and knowing their whys about why they're coming to school or why they're coming back to school or what are their goals and lifelong journey. Over the decade that I've worked in admissions, I have read hundreds, maybe even thousands, of applications, letters of recommendation, essays and personal statements at the graduate and the undergraduate level. And let me tell you, writing is a lost art. I would often read some of these applications, and I would wonder to myself, I wonder what my honors English teachers in high school and my professors would think, looking at some of this work that they send over to a college or university. I mean, I would sometimes question and ask myself, 
Why are people so intimidated or so scared to simply write about themselves? From the misplaced commas or run on sentences or simply just the lack of being able to simply answer the prompt provided. Believe it or not, I've also read questionable letters of recommendation. And I too would question them and wonder why wouldn't they have another set of eyes look at this before they sent it over to a college or a university. I'm telling you, I would sometimes get letters of recommendation about this big telling me why students should or shouldn't come to a college or university. I've had some prolific and groundbreaking conversations via email and calls with prospective students. And sadly, some of these conversations wouldn't always be in their essays. And even sadly, nine times out of 10, I didn't always have the permission to be able to admit them into the program. And this is why writing matters. I not only say writing matters because I'm a writer and a poet and I love both tremendously, but because I'm proof that writing matters. In 2018, after I had took a hiatus off of finishing my undergraduate degree at University of Cincinnati, I had researched for a year and finally found the graduate program for me. The only thing that stood in my way was the GPA, which was a 3.0, which is pretty typical for a graduate degree program. However, remember again, I come from a long line of ambition. So I wasn't gonna self-sabotage and tell myself no without hearing it from the committee first. I put my best foot forward and I poured myself into my essays and prompts. I followed every requirement that they had suggested that I do. And I also was very vulnerable and open about why I simply didn't have a 3.0. I talked about how I made a ballsy move and I transferred my senior year of undergrad from Chicago, Illinois to Cincinnati, Ohio, from a small Catholic university to a large, predominantly open university at University of Cincinnati. From the time I stepped foot on Cincinnati or UC's campus in soil, I was a full-time student. Even in the summer, I was a full-time student. When it came time for me to graduate that last semester, I had taken the most amount of credit hours I had ever taken in my career. 18, with both online and in-person classes. I was burned out in every shape, form, and facet. I literally dragged myself across the finish line so I could finish on the time I was supposed to finish. I shared this with them. A part of the application for my admissions, I had to have an interview with the director at the time and two soon-to-be alumni. I remember the conversation or the interview was so fluid and just welcoming, it didn't even feel like an interview. I remember one of the soon-to-be alumni had printed out and pulled out a copy of one of my essays and said, wow, on top of this wonderful conversation we're having with you, let me just say, this is the graduate level writing that we're looking for. I was honored and humbled that they had taken the time out to read my writing, to get to know me better instead of just looking at a GPA and simply just writing me off as not being prepared for graduate school or for their program. Two weeks after that interview, I got the call. I was accepted provisionally into the program. And I remember being on the phone with the director at the time and I put him on mute and I sobbed and I cried and I just simply just thanked God for giving me my one yes. I had my one yes to get into graduate school that completely changed and utterly enhance my life for the better. Two years after I got that yes, I graduated the youngest of my cohort ever. At 26 years old, with a 3.9 GPA, I had taken and put myself to graduate school financially 100% on my own with no help, and I also became a homeowner as well. Mind you, this was all in 2020 when we were all in quarantine. I still to this day am immensely proud of myself and I always share this testimony with my applicants and because I remind them, if I can do it, why can't you? Outside of just college admissions and writing for school and writing to get into school, I actually take back what I said initially. Writing matters and it can never be a lost art. It is one of many ways that we as human beings communicate with one another. When sometimes when words fail us, Writing makes up for it. We have the pleasure of being able to write trash.
paragraphs and edit and proofread and edit some more to finally get out the words that we really want to say to our prospective audience. From a time a student matriculates and graduates, and now they become an alumni, they're working in a field that they spent thousands of dollars to get into and years working to get into. From the time that we wake up, we're exposed to writing on our phones, through text messages, emails, social media, social media marketing, social media advertising, advertising and marketing, public relations, grant proposals, grant writing, hiring letters, denial letters, all types of writing and many, many more we're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis, no matter what field you're planning on working in. And this is why I constantly and consistently urge everyone to practice their writing skills, because it's better, better than just being a phenomenal writer. But when you become a better writer, you become a better communicator. So it not only enhances your writing, but it enhances your communication skills. And even if writing is not your strong suit, there's still so many opportunities to strengthen and sharpen your tools, whether that be Grammarly, LinkedIn Learning, Google or Google Courses, YouTube University, the library with so many free resources for opportunities, a mentor, classes here at the University of Cincinnati or at a junior college, and many, many more. I was often told and prompted by my elders and my ancestors that if you ain't learn it, you ain't living. And so I encourage you to ask yourself, are you living? Thank you.